Hello, welcome to this overview of Genderside and MMIW, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. I'm Beverly Hill, founder and president of the Genderside Awareness Project. What is Genderside? Genderside is the elimination around the world of females from very young to very old due to social causes, to human man-made causes, not to natural causes. Obviously, it's very preventable. Human cause, human solution. So whenever we're talking about gender side, we're always talking about excess female deaths. Gender side is a measure of female deaths in excess of male deaths, age bracket by age bracket, for men and women living in the same country. In short, it's the summation of excess female mortality across all the countries in the world. Now, I mentioned that it's due to social causes. What are these causes in particular? There are four major causes. Uh, again, they're all social in nature. I'm going to list them chronologically according to the lifespan of a woman. First is the largest contributor to gender side. It is the selective abortion of female fetuses in countries where there's a strong preference uh, for sons rather than daughters. Uh, and that accounts for about 50% of the annual loss of females. The next cause after that is lethal neglect of girls age zero to four. And again, it's for the same reason that parents wanted a boy rather than a girl. And they allow their girls to die. They don't give them a protein rich diet as they would for the brothers. If the girls get sick, they don't necessarily take them to the doctor. They won't buy antibiotics if antibiotics are needed. They don't get the girls vaccinated. And so the girls are just sort of allowed to die because they weren't wanted in the first place. The third cause is maternal death. 99% of it occurs in the developing world. And of that 99%, 99% is very preventable at very low cost. Most of these deaths can be prevented with very simple surgeries that cost perhaps $400 or with uh, antibiotics to stop infection or with other drugs that are used to stop hemorrhaging. There's absolutely no excuse for the fact that we lose 300,000 women every year in countries that are spending millions of dollars on their militaries, even more tens and hundreds of millions of dollars on their military. The last cause is one that surprises most people because they just haven't heard about it. And it is the loss of women over age 50, especially widows. And these are older women, but they don't live out to their natural life expectancies because they can't access food and shelter and medical care. This is particularly common in countries where traditionally men control all the wealth and the, all the property. And money and wealth is channeled through the families, through the generations, by way of the males bypassing the females. So, for example, I live in a house. You can see it. If I were to lose my, hu my husband and I were in one of these societies, this house would not become mine. The, our bank accounts, our cars would not become mine. They would go to my sons. And if we didn't have sons, then they would go to my husband's brothers, surviving brothers. The women are completely bypassed. That means that in these countries, older women are entirely dependent on the goodwill of the males in their families to take care of them. And too often that goodwill is not there. So this, believe it or not, is the second largest cause uh, of gender side. It is the second largest cause of the annual loss of females. So how many people are we talking about? These numbers are calculated 
by demographers, university demographers, and reported by the United Nations Population Fund. Using data from the 2020 census, uh, the demographers calculated that 143 million women and girls are, quote, missing from the world population. Now, the word missing is a demographer's euphemism. It means that they are dead. That number is obviously huge, 143 million. But to put it in context, let's do some comparisons. That, that number is would be 43% of the United States population. That's how many women have been eliminated from our world. Another way to put it in context is to compare it with other atrocities and huge losses of life. In World War I, we lost 20 million people. In World War II, we lost 70 million. The genocide of the indigenous peoples in the New World, the Native Americans, um, not just in North America, but in Central and South America too, adds up to about 100 million. Uh, gender side is the loss of 143 million. It is the largest atrocity the world has seen, and yet virtually no one knows about it. The last way to make sense of the number is to express it as a percentage of the female population. So understood that way, 143 million is 3.7% of the world's female population. Now, think about it. If you lost almost 4% of any other demographic group, an ethnic group, a racial group, a, a religious group, there would be protest, there would be violence, there would be war. 3.7% of this demographic group, you know, roughly half the world's population, isn't there. They've been lost due to man-made causes and nobody even knows about it. So where does this occur? It is a global problem. Most of it occurs in Asia, East Asia and South Asia and the Middle East and Africa. But we also find it in Southeastern Europe and at very, very small levels, we find it universally. So let me show you some maps. The problem is most acute in China. China has lost, or more accurately eliminated, 10% of its female population, which is really astonishing. It's a huge loss of life. India is right behind with 9% of its female population eliminated. Now, if you look at this map, you can see the red obviously is where the problem is most severe. You can see where the selective abortion of female fetuses and the gross neglect of little girls is most common. So this map shows you where females are being lost early in life because there's a strong preference for sons over daughters. The next map shows you where women are lost due to maternal death. Problem is most severe in Africa, followed by South Asia, and then some other scattered areas in the world. And lastly, here we see where older women fail to live out to their natural life expectancies because economic resources are controlled by men. Again, it's East Asia and South Asia and Africa where the problem is most severe. So why does this occur? Why are girls so unwanted? Why are, are women so unwanted? Uh, there are two basic reasons. The first is that in a traditional society, uh, girls do not take care of their parents uh, their own parents when those parents are older. Instead, the tradition is that a girl marries a young man from another village fairly far away, and she leaves her home and she moves in with him and his parents because the generations live together. And in former times, there were no cars to get back and forth. She could not easily travel back to her village to take care of her parents so she would take care of his parents in their old age. 
And this tradition is embodied in Proverbs. Uh, in China, you have a daughter is the thief. In other words, you raise her and then she goes and takes care of someone else in their old age. Or in India, raising a daughter is like watering your neighbor's garden. So that's the first reason that girls are unwanted. The second reason is the huge cost of uh, a wedding and particularly a dowry in countries where dowry is practiced. Uh, I think most of you know the dowry is a gift from the parents of the bride to the parents of the groom. It can either take the form of material things like appliances or a car or even a house, or it can be a sum of money. The, the bride's parents uh, bear these costs and also pay for the wedding. It can add up to two years of a family's income. So it is really an economic wallop coming at a time when people are beginning to think about their retirement. Again, there's no social security in these countries that people can rely on for support in old age. In countries where the dowry is practiced or in regions where it's practiced, 60% of families will go into debt when a daughter is married. Often they can't access standard bank loans and they have to borrow from loan sharks who charge usurious interest rates. So the result of all this is that we have more boys being born. We have more men than women in these societies. And it actually distorts the natural sex ratio significantly. So when you have a society where men outnumber women, what happens? What are the social consequences? The first and most immediate is an increase in sex trafficking. It's no coincidence that the areas in the world that have the most distorted sex ratio, and that would be uh, Northwestern India and Southeastern China, that those areas are also hotbeds for sex trafficking. And associated with that, we have bride trafficking. You've heard of mail order brides. Keep in mind that these uh, women are often transported across borders in this shadowy black market for, for brides. And in their new countries, they are not legal citizens. They have no legal rights at all. Um, they can be beaten by their husbands. They can be resold by their husbands. They can be uh, exploited for labor. <clears throat> no matter what happens, they cannot go to the police and get help. This is a very vulnerable, exploitable group of people. Next, we have child marriage. You can imagine that if there are more bachelors of marriageable age than, than women of marriageable age, um, all the women get snapped up. You still have some leftover bachelors, so they look to younger women, to girls, for brides. You can see the groom there is much older than the bride. And here again, you see some examples of child marriage. This obviously is not a relationship of equals. The, the older males here have the decision-making power and the control. And child marriage, it turns out, leads directly to the next consequence, which is an increase in maternal death. Child brides very quickly become child mothers. And very young mothers, mothers under the age of 15, are five times more likely to die in childbirth than women of appropriate childbearing age. The girl in the photograph is 14. I, we know that from reading the story associated with the photo. She's bathing her newborn, and at her feet you see her two-year-old daughter so she had her first child when she was 12. Now, so far, all of the social consequences that I've listed, sex trafficking, bride trafficking, um, child marriage, and maternal death, those all affect women. And notice that they're all bad. Uh, many people think that if you have a shortage of women, the women are in high demand and their status will improve. Well, actually, just the opposite occurs, as you just saw. The consequences can also be very bad for men. Uh, there are always going to be men left over who don't find life partners. And in China today, 
Um, one out of five young men will never find a bride or a, a, a life partner. That's 20% of young men will never marry. And they tend to be the least educated and the lowest wage earners. China is the only country that has studied its population of involuntary bachelors. That's the term for them. Uh, and they found high rates of depression, loneliness, addiction, suicide, and a markedly shorter life expectancy, just 68 years as opposed to 75 years. Uh, these men, because they are low wage earners and poorly educated, they tend to be migrant workers in construction and agriculture. They never become part of a community. They never develop a set of permanent friends. They don't have any support network. Uh, and it is a really hard life. Lastly, we see an increase in crime. I don't have time to describe the studies, but both India and China have documented that when the sex ratio um, becomes masculinized, there is an increase in crime. So the upshot of this is that a healthy sex ratio, a normal self, uh, sex ratio stabilizes a society and makes it a more desirable place to live. Governments, are they doing anything? If this is such a big problem, um, you would think governments would be doing something about it. The fact is that only China and India have taken any action it's been very half-hearted, very tepid, and there really, there hasn't been much improvement. India has seen no improvement. They've spent huge sums of money on the problem, but it has been siphoned off due to corruption or misspent due to corruption, and there has been no improvement. China also spent a lot of money, and they were making progress, but when Xi Jinping came to power, he did not attach any priority to this problem and progress has leveled off. Note that in both countries, sex selective abortion is illegal or that law is routinely ignored um, and there's no political will to enforce the law. So if governments aren't doing anything, if we don't have top-down measures that are working, what can we do? What can we do at a grassroots bottom-up level there are three principal things. We can educate poor girls. Um, we believe that, our group believes that educating poor girls so that they are economically useful to their families and self-reliant so that they don't depend on husbands, we believe that's the best long-term solution to the problem. We can also give women job skills and uh, microloans to start up their own small little businesses, and we can provide maternal health care. Uh, you know, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this slide. There are studies showing the benefits of educating girls, and I'm going to advance to the problem of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Now, that is the form of gender side that we see here. It's one of two forms that we see here in the United States. <clears throat> it's a problem that has gotten very little attention in the press because it occurs in Western states, away from the big cities, on reservations and in what is called Indian country. But there is a phenomenon of Indigenous women who disappear or are their bodies are found by the sides of the road in just appalling numbers, uh, astonishing numbers. Often these deaths are not even reported. In the tribal lands, there are jurisdictional disputes as to whether these crimes should be handled by the tribal authorities or by the county authorities or by the state authorities. And by the time all that is sorted out and it is decided who should investigate these crimes, the, the trail is cold. It's way, way too late to investigate, uh, let alone prosecute these crimes. It's estimated that, that at least, at, very, at the very least, five to 6,000 Indigenous women, most of them young, have gone missing or been murdered. 
And there are um, nonprofits now that are tracking this and trying to generate numbers. Recently, Congress passed a law called Savannah's Law to address at least the reporting of this and make sure that these deaths are recorded. Very often, these women, when they're found, their, their bodies are found, they are identified as being Hispanic rather than indigenous. So we really don't know the size of the problem. There are several reasons this is happening. One is there are man camps for oil and gas drilling in these lands. And the drilling rigs are operated by men who actually earn very good wages. It's high paying work because it's dangerous and really hard work. But they are housed in what are called man camps, which are like army barracks. There's a lot of alcoholism, a lot of drug use, a lot of prostitution, and indigenous women get caught up in this and they disappear. Some of this also is associated with sex trafficking. There are a lot of indigenous women are either kidnapped and trafficked or they will prostitute themselves because they just don't have any other options. They, they don't have jobs. They don't have any other way to survive. So we really don't have a good handle on this problem. There's so little information about it. We're working on it. And uh, that concludes my presentation.